So what is limits of error and what is percentage error? Understanding this is very important. Okay. So whenever we are telling uh, in the last class and uh, the last session, we discussed about two important terminologies, accuracy and precision. What is accuracy? What is precision? We have seen accuracy. It is a quantitative term. Okay. We cannot determine quantity based on accuracy. So to understand how accurate it is to quantify accuracy, we require something called as error. Okay. So error is inversely proportional to accuracy. When the error increases, accuracy will decrease. So when error decreases, accuracy will increase. So here, limits of error, how much error is acceptable? That is also very significant. You cannot say, okay, 100% of error is uh, accept, uh, acceptable, then our accuracy becomes zero. So we need a limit which uh, says when to accept a data as accurate or not. At the same time, what is the percentage error? Okay, how much percentage error is required? Now, this is very, very, very important, mainly with external quality control purposes, where they use this to check the accuracy of estimate. Okay, for any method, if it is accurate or not, external quality assurance plays a very important role. And here, percentage error and limits of errors play a very important role in giving quantification to the accuracy. So let us understand what is error first. So in simple words, we can say it's a mistake, okay? But technical or statistical difference is slightly different. So it's a measure of estimated difference between observed or calculated value of a quantity and its true value. Okay, we have seen this definition in the last session as well. A measure of, to measure the estimated difference. This is not the calculated difference, it is an estimated difference between what is observed okay when we do a analysis and we get a result that is our observed value and its true value what is the exact value that difference is called as error so what is error a statistical or technical definition a measure of estimated difference between observed or calculated value for any of a quantity and its true value. Why errors are significant? Okay, why these statistical errors are very important? So here uh, we have to be very, you know, as recent as possible with our explanation. If you go long back, those uh, those reasons have been made. Some of those reasons may have been made obsolete. So it is not very useful, okay? So our focus will be on recent developments in this field. So let's go back to 20 years, 2002. So Bonini and his uh, teammates, okay? They observed there is considerable agreement in distribution of errors. They found out most errors occurred, okay? How the accuracy is getting affected, he said, the errors seen during pre or post analytical phases throughout the analytical process. Okay, let me repeat again. He found out that errors occurred mostly in pre or post analytical phase. We had discussed the need for controlling pre and post analytical phases because analytical phase is almost completely automated. So rarely there will be any variation happening without the notice of the operator. So here it's very important in 2002, they found out that most errors, the causes were either in the pre-analytical phase or post-analytical phase that was going to affect the accuracy. Then we'll move, up, move in 10 years in 2012, Julie Hammerling found by reviewing lots of data that 46 to 68.2 percent of the error occurred in pre-analytical phase and around 18.5 to 47 percent in the post-analytical phase. Okay, so now here the first observation we make that it's a qualitative uh, 
data. Okay, so it says most errors occurred. How much we don't know. And in 2012, Julie Hammerling provides us the data to support what Monini was telling in 2002. Okay, according to her review process of laboratory data, around let's take 50% here and 35% here, which is roughly in the middle. So 50 to 35% of the uh, errors that are happening in pre-analytical phase and post-analytical phase. That's why it's very important how accuracy is getting effective when the sample comes into the lab. Okay, before the sample comes into the lab, that means it is rarely under the control of laboratory technicians. However, we need to standardize this. Okay. So that is what the significance I'm trying to tell here. The role of laboratory in minimizing the errors caused in pre-analytical and post-analytical phases is very significant, even though those areas are not directly under the control of the lab. Okay. So somebody else is going to do the reason, uh, reason for this error responsible for this error and it has an effect on the overall accuracy of the testing okay so let's say limits of error the limits of error are maximum overestimate and maximum underestimate from the combination of sampling and non-sampling errors the statistical or the technical definition of limits of error was something like this okay whenever we do estimation we need to do overestimation okay so let's say whenever we speak, it is the maximum overestimate and the maximum underestimate from the combination of sampling and non-sampling errors. Okay. So again, it's categorized. The errors can be categorized in many ways. We are categorizing them based on the faces in the quality. Okay. But this definition categorizes them in sampling and non-sampling areas. Next, you have to know is allowable errors. Okay, so what is allowable error? A systematic error that is acceptable both analytically and statistically is called as allowable error. Okay, so this is the question. This this word you will uh, uh, listen here in the lab lots of time. Whenever you are talking about external quality control and the accuracy of the testing, what is the allowable error? Okay, so understand this. It is a systematic error that is acceptable both analytically and statistically. Okay, it should not have an effect on the analysis and statistical. There is a limit for this also. Okay, so that is limits of error. Okay, there is no exact word for that that you have to derive. That is not necessary for you right now. Next is percentage error. Okay, it is a difference between measured and known value that is true value, which is divided by known value into 100 users percentage error. So then what is error? Error is measured value minus known value divided by known value. So let's just consider uh, and let us take an example. Okay. The measured value is the one that you are going to send it back to the third party for the unknown sample. So as the third party person, what I will do, I will use this formula, me measured value. Let's say for understanding purpose, yours is 95. Okay, 95 minus the known value is 100 divided by 100 into 100. So what is the percentage error then? Ninety-five minus hundred is five divided by hundred into hundred that cancels. So percentage error we get is five percent. Okay. So here, no, there is no positive or negative uh, signs here. Is that both we take it as positive only. So five percent error is the percentage error. Is five percent acceptable? That is being derived from you in your own laboratory. Okay. So I will derive an error for my own accept acceptable or allowable limits of error in for my laboratory. If it is within that, then I accept it. If it is not. That means there is no accuracy. Okay, it's not the accuracy is not up to the mark. You have to find the reason why this is happening. Okay. 
right? So allowable percentage errors. Now let us see some of the uh, governing bodies what they say or what limits of errors they are giving as guidelines. So let us start with NABL. NABL gives us a, a guideline of 90%. Okay. What is the meaning 90%? That is, there is 10% error available. So 10% error allowed. Okay. 90% should be accurate. 10% is allowed. So 90 to 100, if you get a value anywhere between 90 to 100, it is sat satisfactory. If you get a accuracy value of 90 to 95, that's very good. Between 95 to 100, it is excellent. Okay. So something we have to keep in mind here. So who gives us the allowable percentage or uh, percentage errors allowable? So these are given by governing bodies or we can derive ourselves. Okay, we have that option. There is a process for this. There is a methodology for deriving our own limits of error and allowable error. But we prefer when we take it from NABL. Okay, so NABL gives us 90. There are others also. You can make it, you can change it also based on your own statistical analysis and you can keep it for 95 percent also it is fine but percentage errors is always defined okay it's always there the value is there without that value the overall accuracy of your testing is not valid okay you are doing excellent you are getting 99 percent uh, in your uh, testing but if you have not set any values okay the value for percentage error or acceptable errors, then the whole process becomes invalid in terms of accuracy. So accuracy will be given as unknown because you are not set whatever you are getting, then it is considered to be by fluke or by chance. So it is very important. So let us have a quick re recap of what we have done in today's class. So we started with error. The technical definition of error is a measure of estimated difference between the observed or the calculated value of a quantity and its true value. Very important. So it is an indicator of accuracy, a quantitative indicator of accuracy. It gives number to accuracy. Okay, error. So significance we have seen. We have seen errors happen mostly in pre-analytical and post-analytical post basis, which has a direct impact on accuracy of the analysis. Limits of error, it's defined as the error or uh, limits of error are the maximum overestimate and the maximum underestimate from the combination of sampling and non-sampling errors. That's not very important. So here, this part is very important. Allowable error is systematic error that is acceptable both analytically and statistically. Okay, Both in terms of analysis, it needs to be passed and statistically it needs to pass. Now, what is this allowable error and who gives us that is given? There is some help we can expect from the governing bodies. They will give us a rough number. If you want to your method to be very accurate in your laboratory, you have to define your own limits of errors and your own allowable error okay so next is percentage error it's a difference between measured and known value which is divided by the known value into 100 that gives us percentage error very important allowable percentage errors are the limits we can set based on nabl which which is so okay currently is accepting 90 percent accuracy if anything between 90 to 100 is considered to be satisfactory between 90 to 95 as good and 95 to 100 as excellent Okay, so these are these were the references to uh, preparing this uh, session, right? Reference values and interpretations. So, what are reference values? A value obtained by observation or measurement of a particular type of quantity on a reference individual is called as reference value. Let me again define reference value, a value obtained by observation or measurement of a particular type of quantity on a reference individual. Okay. 
So in short terms, we can say reference values are values we expect for a healthy person in a given population. Okay, key word here is given population. In a population, the values we expect to consider a person to be healthy is called as reference value. Anything above that range, it is abnormally high. Anything below is abnormally low. Okay. We also call it as normal values. Okay. We keep on telling this what is the normal value for that. Normal value of creatine is between 0 0.6 to 1.2 milligram per dl. So this is the values that you have derived for that population. Consider anyone to be healthy if the sample gives us a result within that range. Okay. So we check reference values by comparing the values that we obtain from testing with the reference range. Okay. So before going to uh, reference ranges, let us have a brief discussion on who are these individuals? Okay, so here, if you see the definition, there is a point at the end says which says quantity on a reference individual. So to prepare a reference range, we require these reference individuals. So who are these individual persons? There are some criteria, okay? Are the more numbers of reference individuals we get for uh, this exercise, it is better more number is better because it increases the statistical accuracy and precision of our method and also eliminates most of the uh, factors variables that can cause an error however selecting the individuals is very important there is some criteria okay we cannot consider everyone within a population to form a reference individual okay we cannot select everyone there is a criteria number one the person should be of the gender and age for which we are preparing the reference range let us say in our college we are going to calculate or we are going to set a reference range for glucose okay random blood glucose level let's consider in our population in our college we require a reference population okay a range of people who act as representatives of that population okay so we have to select a minimum of 20 maximum of how much ever it is possible more number it is but minimum is 20 20 people are required number one if we are saying the uh, we are calculating random glucose level of boys in the province the reference individual should be all boys, they cannot be girls. Okay. If we are checking for the student random blood glucose level, we cannot include staff into the reference. It has to be student, it has to be male, okay, it has to be healthy. That is next thing. If a deceased person comes into this, it, it screws up all the reference uh, reference range uh, validation and verification. So we have to redo it again. 20 people of same gender, of same age, healthy without any diseases are chosen. Okay. We collect their blood. Once blood is collected, we do the test. We get the result and we do a statistical analysis and prepare the range. Okay. The range of the reference which includes all the values that have been collected from the reference individuals okay so statistical analysis is done there are many uh, methods we can employ uh, use here but we are not uh, going to discuss that we at the end of this exercise let's say we get a ra random blood glucose range of 90 to 110 okay so that will be the reference range for our college population. So next time, whenever if we do a test randomly for uh, one student's blood glucose level, okay, random blood glucose level, if the values fall within this range, which we have established, only then that student will be considered to be having normal blood glucose level. If it is outside, let's say 
we got a range of 90 to 110 and the student gets 115 then it is high it is normal so that is the role of reference rate okay when we employ more and more factors into this when we go for hormonal analysis where age age groups are important difference between uh, adults and children is important difference between pregnant women and non pregnant women is important when whenever we are uh, applying all these factors it makes it more complex and more important for derivation of reference values okay so that is the importance of reference values anyways so reference range is a set of values that include upper and lower limits of a test based on healthy population we have seen that the values depend on factors such as age sex and type of specimen again we have seen the reference ranges are prepared by collecting samples for the population okay for the population from the population okay for our college students or our college reference range we cannot go and ask with another college students to collect the blood and establish upper and lower limits of the range okay so next part is interpretation how to interpret this why uh, where we can use this and see how to see if the patient is normal or abnormal okay when observed value that is the value you get from doing the test is compared with the reference range you have to compare to see if it is normal or abnormal if your value is within the range then it is considered as normal or healthy for that parameter okay so let's say glucose we have our range of 90 to 110 when you do the test, you get 95. Okay. When you compare it with the reference range, it is within the range, then that patient's sample is considered normal for glucose. Okay. If it is outside the limit, either on the lower side, that means less than 90, or on the upper side, that means more than 110, is considered to be clinically low or clinically high and should be medically estimated as unhealthy okay so here yeah, these words are very important clinically low and clinically high okay that means the the sample is high or low so medical estimation is given as unhealthy and there should be supporting data to say the patient is actually unhealthy the sample becomes unhealthy here okay so with that we are at the end of the session